straight like that, man. We do it. Straight like that, man. We do it. Mike Knight, and today we have another installment of our Black Businesses and CSRA edition series. And um, when we have that, that 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 series, we don't like to limit it to just uh, people who have businesses in the CSRA area, but we also like to extend it to those who are native to the CSRA area and who have went away and you know did great things. Um, with that being said, here today we have my guest. Um, Ms. Dominica Henderson Reese. Would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you for having me. Yes, I am Dominica Henderson Reese, uh, born and raised here in Augusta, Georgia, and I'm just happy to be on the podcast with you today. Mm -hmm. Glad to have you. Glad to have you. Little tidbit I'll go ahead and share and throw it out there to you all. Dominica is actually my sister. Um, one of my, um, she's my third sister <laughs> to be exact i have so many sisters um yeah she's my third older sister to be exact and um yeah she's um like i said we we don't we don't like to uh just limit it to uh local um businesses in, in the csra she's actually uh in town for the holiday season for her and her family from la yeah yeah um we don't make it home as often as we used to that's what happens when i guess you go off and start a family and yeah. things get a little bit um, more difficult and complex in terms of scheduling but i always love coming back and um spending the time with with the family and just seeing you know yeah. just the area and how it's grown and what's happening that's always exciting too yeah yeah it's always great to have you guys back in town man always always um that's a little short intro about yourself, but you like to, you know, tell the people out there who don't know, who's not familiar with you, um, a little bit more about yourself, a little bit in depth. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, again, I'm born and raised here in Augusta. Key and I, we grew up in South Augusta. Um, I am Butler, Matt. <laughs> graduate <laughs> of Glen Hills High School. I'm also um, an alumni of the former Augusta State University as well. Um, uh, and so, yeah, Augusta is home. Um, I did, uh, again, spend some time here. And then once I graduated from college, I moved to Charleston initially. And I had a little stint in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, I was uh, accepted a job back here in Augusta, Georgia, working for a marketing organization. And that was how... Actually, that was my introduction to financial services industry. Was was that um, was that opportunity that arose there? Okay, that sounds good. You actually uh, almost started the interview for me. Uh, <laughs> that was kind of like a couple of my questions right there. But we're going to go ahead and get into that. Um, yeah, um, yeah. That was that was one of my first questions. Was going to be exactly how did you you know your path go into that financial industry? Yeah, you know the thing is is that. You know, right, you and I, right. the way we were raised, we were raised by our grandmother. Um, very, very old school, if you would. Um, a child stays in a child's yeah, place. Tradition. Finances were never discussed. So me being a certified financial planner, independent investment advisor, is not anything that was on my trajectory. Right. I didn't even know anything about business, finance, any of that. And as a matter of fact, I did not go to school for this. Um, I majored, I'm a, I'm a chemist on paper, <laughs> believe it or not. So, um, this is something that I like to say happened to me. It, again, it wasn't anything that I sought out. I was fortunate enough. I was fortunate enough to, um, meet a local individual, as a matter of fact, a gentleman by the name of J. Timothy Shelnut. Um, Mr. Shelnut. yeah, very wealthy individual. Most of, he has a building down at the 
Medical College of Georgia that's named after him. He was on the Board of Regents for the state of Georgia. And it was him that introduced me to this world that I now am involved in today. And actually at my graduation, right. he spoke. He was one of the speakers at my graduation from Augusta State University. Amazing. And he then said, Dominica, what are you doing after after this? And I was not interested in staying in Augusta at all. I was like, oh, I'm done. I'm out. I'm moving to Charleston. And he, um, he said to me then, he was like, listen, I would love to have you work for me. And again, I was, I had tunnel vision. I was just so focused on getting out of the area. And you know, the thing is to, um, I think that was part of just me and maturing and wanting to, you know, be grown, right, you right, know, as, right. as they say. And so I had to venture out in order to, you know, get pulled back in, if you would. And that's what happened. But uh, so I, I moved to Charleston. I worked for a labor company. I was literally selling day labor. Um, so anywhere I saw a crane up in the air, I would go up and speak to the foreman and try to see if I could sell day labor to, mm. to them to help. Um, but that was tough, you know, and growing up the way that we grew up, we didn't grow up in a two parent household. Right. Uh, I was a hundred percent self-supported throughout college. I went to school full time. I worked full time. I was living off on my own. And so, um, when I took that job, it was, it was a sales job and that was difficult because 98% of my salary was based upon, With um, sales or not. exactly. It was strictly compensation. Um, yeah, just based upon sales revenue. And when you're starting out, that's extremely difficult. And three months in, you know, it got to a point where I literally couldn't buy a loaf of bread. Right. And and I was like, I have to do something different. And so maybe taking a salary position isn't so bad after all. And that's how I ended up back in Augusta. And that's also how I started in financial services. Okay. So, so your journey to Charleston pretty much gave you some experience, which in turn segued you, segued you back to your home. Yep, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So it was, it, that was, was that this part one, I say phase one of your struggle? Yeah. yeah. Okay. You know, looking back, yeah, it was because that taught me a lot. You mm -hmm. know, um, obviously you want to go out and venture out and do your own thing, but you, you sometimes learn some hard lessons along the way. You know, and again, being in a completely different city, I knew one person that was my very best friend at the time, yeah. um, but I was out there by myself and, mm. and again, working and not really, you know, having income to support myself. And again, we didn't come from a household where we had family that right. we could rely on and say, hey, I'm a little short or, right. you know, had a savings account that we could then, no you know, just draw phones. on or anything yeah. like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it was a completely different mm, scenario and situation comparing myself to, say, my best friend at the time that was doing the same thing. Mm. Okay. Yeah, that's, I'm going to get back into that part right there because that's some of my questions I had lined up. Um, let me ask you this. Um, what exactly... Let's say once you made it back home from Charleston, what was some of your motivation for changing your path from the, I guess that's basically what you were doing was like sales to the financial path industry. I know you mentioned Mr. Shellnut. So what exactly was your motivation once you got back here? Um, so motivation once I got back to Augusta was um, just really honestly at that time because I was young, you know, I was early 20s. It was just more so me being able to continue to support myself. Right. I didn't really, ha I had no idea what I was stepping into. So I, it wasn't this grand or elaborate plan where I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. I didn't have any, I didn't have a plan. Right. Right. It right. wasn't written down for me. Um, I was just, I was at a point where I knew I had to do something different than what I was currently doing. And this avenue led me to a place where I could do that and mm -hmm. feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. And so that's what happened. Cool. That sounds amazing. That sounds real, really, really exciting, actually. Um, let me ask you this. Um, did you find any support as far as when you first got into the industry, being a mm -hmm. young, very young black woman at the time, did you find a lot of support or a lot of resistance? 
Ooh, that's a really good question. So in my position initially starting out in the industry, I was um, kind of back office because I was a wholesaler. Okay. okay. So when you think about the financial services industry there, I mean, that is so complex in and of itself because it could cover so many different um job descriptions and avenues um it is it, is a pretty broad right yeah. uh industry so for me though what i was i was a wholesaler so as a, go ahead I'm, I'm sorry i didn't mean to cut you but you, you, you that's the second time you mentioned wholesaler exactly what is that in the financial world i know what wholesaling is, is in the real estate field Right. What is wholesaling in a financial world? Right. Great. So sorry about that. Yeah. So as a wholesaler, so like I'll 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 back it up just one step further. So okay. I said that I moved back to Augusta and I was working for Tim who had a marketing organization. Right. So when you think about financial services, particularly financial advisors, then as a financial advisor, you then contract with different insurance companies typically. Okay. One of the layers with between that relationship between the advisor and the insurance company is often a marketing organization, okay. um, an independent marketing organization. That's what IMO stands for. And that's what we were here in Augusta. Okay. And it was nationwide. We represented Asians. I mean, I'm sorry, agents all across the country. Right. Mm -hmm. So from Hawaii, California, all the way, obviously here to Georgia, but all across, we had agents in all the states. And so as a wholesaler for the marketing organization, I was basically the liaison. Okay. So when, a, say for instance, an advisor is sitting in front of a client mm -hmm. and the client is 50 years old and they have X number of dollars and they're looking for this specific product or strategy. What would then happen typically is that advisor would then call me up and say, hey, Dominica, this is the scenario I have. What are um, the best, the top three options that I should go back and present to my client? Okay. So I was responsible for doing the research, doing the back end work for the advisor. And then the advisor would then go out and relay that to their client. Whatever they decide to do, obviously, that was dependent upon that client advisor relationship mm -hmm. but they would rely on me to provide them with the information that was necessary so then they could take that back to their client oh, okay does that make sense yeah it makes a lot of sense and so as a wholesaler i had to be knowledgeable and this was my introduction right so this was my introduction to the industry and this is how i learned the industry it was largely dealing with insurance companies again these are some of your major big insurance companies your midland your LSWs, your former INGs, your former Chase, Zurich, et cetera. Um, we had relationships with all the various insurance companies. Okay. And then so I was responsible for knowing basically all of their products. I had to know all of their products Everything because they offer because you in turn have to introduce them to some potential clients. Right. Products. Because gotcha. the agents would then rely on me to then feed the information to them. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay, that's good. That's good. Um let me ask you this question. Are there many women in the financial industry? No. <laughs> okay. And that's going to give you a, I want this to be like a two-part answer. Right. Are there many, you already asked me part, like, no, there's not a lot of women. Are there many black women? And that's a double no. Ooh, no, okay. it's not. I mean, and I've been in the industry for 16 years now. So I'm 16 okay. years in. And even working as a wholesaler, you would see, you know, so when you go in the conferences, you would see ladies, right? You would see women, but typically they're the assistants, mm. they're doing some type of administrative type work, but actually being, um, having that core relationship and being the advisor and being the business owner, no, it is a male dominated industry. Um, and if I were to get very, you know, specific in, in regards to that, it's the all white man's right. industry, right. right? So oftentimes when I would go to conferences, again, even early on in my career, that's, that's what dominated um, the industry at the time. And I am happy to say that over the course, you know, of, of the time that I've been in the industry, mm -hmm. I am seeing more women, but again, it is, it's not anywhere it's near where it should be. Predominantly male driven. It certainly yeah. is. So let me ask you this. I, I've met the, the woman for the firm you work with, you're associated with. Yes. Um, 
I believe that's Houseman Financial. Correct. Yep. Yeah. Um, how did you, how did you come about to actually find a firm that was uh, ran by a woman? Yeah. So that was one of the things that happened to me as well. <laughs> I feel like a lot of um, my career trajectory has all been um, kind of not being afraid to just put myself out there or right. ask questions. Right. But um, quite honestly, I contacted Trudy, Trudy Hausman, who's the owner of Hausman Financial, which is the firm that I'm associated with. I contacted Trudy um, while I was in Augusta oh, after I gave here. birth to okay. Kinsley. Yeah, you to my had, youngest. You had, a, you had a previous relationship with her already? No, I did not know her at all. So okay. I'm a certified financial planner. Right. Um, and so I was on the CFP's website and okay. on the CFP's website, they have advertisements for different uh, job openings. So okay. oftentimes other certified financial planners can go on and post openings that they have available. Yeah. And she actually had a post, um, a job opening for an assistant. And at the time I had taken like a two year hiatus because I had just started my family. I had just right. had Zoe, who's right. my oldest. Um, and then I was here with Kinsley and I was like, okay, I've had two years off. I need to really to get back, to get back you yeah. know, into the swing of things. And I contacted her and I, uh, again, that was by way of the CFP's website. Um, and literally the day I arrived back in California, I had uh, my initial phone interview a week later. I had my in-person interview and I would say a week after that, um, she brought me on board as an advisor, not even as an assistant. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. So how you, I mean, I hear you say you, you've been in the financial industry for 16 years. How much of that time have you spent actually at a houseman? Oh uh, yeah. So eight years hey, because okay. yes. Gage so, by, gage by your exactly. Door, that's the, that's the good easy part of it. Okay. I can be like, Oh, how old is Kinsley? Okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so it's been eight years. I've been with houseman financial for eight years. That's great. Mm -hmm. That's great. So what are some of the um your 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 best experiences working one on the west coast um California and two in the financial market that's a male dominated driven over there Yeah so that's a really good question too um one of the things I really enjoy about working on the west coast and it's not really fair um but it's just the reality of it is oftentimes, especially in my industry, because I'm dealing with assets, I'm dealing with real dollars right, here. Right. Um, a lot of like me, for instance, I was shell shocked when I first went to California because the sticker price on imagine. everything is so much higher, right. Mm -hmm. Than what it is here. Um, but at the same time, the level of income that individuals earn are, are significantly higher as well okay. right I remember um, my first salary job I was making twenty four thousand dollars a year right at the mm -hmm. age of in, in California no and here in Augusta Georgia okay that's when I moved back um, when I was recruited out to California at 24 I was making seventy five thousand dollars so wow. as a 24 year old been able to to move out to the West Coast and made $75,000 a year, that's significant for me because that was more money than I had ever seen. Definitely a great game changer. Yeah, yeah. it was. Um, and then so when you, but in order to be able to continue that type of income and lifestyle, obviously you have to have the clients that are there to support it. Um, and I will say that that makes a difference, you know, so when you talk about demographics and, um, employment and, and the wages that people earn, right. when you have that type of scenario where your average client is earning a couple of hundred thousand dollars a year and they're consistently saving, they're very diligent in those practices, that makes a difference when you're, when in comparison, say to, um, say other places that are maybe more rural where mm -hmm. they don't have the the same level of income now with that there's another side of that because at the same time the cost of living isn't as expensive right. um, but it certainly makes it a lot easier uh, to then continue to grow your practice 
Okay. And to have a, a successful, I shouldn't say successful practice, because you can still have a successful practice regardless of where you are in the country. Um, it's just a matter of knowing your market, understanding your market, and then really, you know, tailoring in and, and building those relationships with the clients. Right. But I will say certainly for me, um, just being able to work with individuals with such what I consider, especially again, coming from our background, high levels of income. Um, and then just not having to, I shouldn't say fight, but, you know, the willingness that they have and the understanding to want to be diligent in their savings and their investings and their growing of their wealth. Is that the clients you're talking about? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. That's amazing. Um, let me see. What else? I, what was on? Uh, oh yeah. Um, how difficult was it moving to the West Coast alone back in what was it? Oh five. Yeah, it was two thousand. How difficult was that experience? You know, honestly, I'm not your typical individual. So, <laughs> <laughs> so for me, it was exciting. Okay. Like I was, I was and then excited. At the time you were, 20-something? Yes, yes, I was yeah. early 20s. I was young. Yeah. Um, I did not have any responsibilities at the time. I yeah. did not. I wasn't married. I did not have any kids. Right. And so the idea that I would be able to move out to California and live. That's, that's pretty much every kid, especially a kid from where we come from. That's exactly. Clean, you know? Yeah. yeah. But I will say with, with the glitz and the glam, there were times, though, where, you know, you do miss home. And, yeah. you know, again, I moved out there with my um, business associate. I had mentors, Paul and Jean Vogel, which right. you know and are familiar with. Um, and that was pretty much it. You know, I knew all of four people <laughs> there Man, that's that's when amazing. I moved there. Um, but, but I think having, I mean, my, my family was instrumental. I did come home a lot in the early days. Right. Um, I was constantly, you know, like flying home yeah. and, and getting that feel. And that I got did. Real quick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that got real quick. <laughs> it did. <laughs> it did. Um, and and so yeah, church was instrumental. Yeah. Um, building um, just relationships, right, uh, was instrumental. But also the the hustle and a grind was really important for me, and mm. that really kept me focused too. Yeah. Kept yeah. me centered and, and focused on everything. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I could imagine that um it would take a lot of that to stay yeah in that in that in that type of an industry you would have to stay focused to, to be um have potential, you know, to, to excel. You know? Yeah. So let me ask you this, would you what advice could you offer mm -hmm. or what insight would you give um young women young black women, young women of any color, it doesn't matter, but young women to go into the field or who, who, not, who are not even interested in the field to let them know the potential that's there for them in building a career as a CFA, uh, CPA, um, those types of uh, careers. Yeah, no, that's a really great question. And again, you know, I'm, I'm just like you. I didn't grow up with the background. I didn't grow up with an understanding. I didn't go to school for this. Um, it was again something that that happened to me, Chemistry. right? <laughs> <laughs> and um, I I say explore it. It doesn't take a whole lot to get started, right? So um, I've mentioned that I'm a certified financial planner, but when I started out, I wasn't. I was a simple financial advisor, which any of you can become by taking a 40 hour um course and if you're residing here in the state of georgia with the state of, at the state of georgia and you so long as you pass that course then technically you're a financial advisor um once you do that i say partner with someone work as an assistant right. learn the business learn the trades learn the strategies take all that you can and work your way up from say that assistant role to then being a junior advisor 
you know, as a junior advisor, you then have that senior advisor who's going to, you know, bring you under the wing. The 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 trouble, not the trouble part, the the difficult part is then making sure you're with a firm who believes in you and that you can believe in as well, right? Mm. Because there are all, again financial advisors are a dime a dozen but do your do your due diligence do your homework you know check their you can do background checks uh check to see how big their 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 business is and let me say this because our industry is so very well dominated again by older white men that also means there are a lot of practices out there who more than likely do not have a succession plan in place Mm. Right. So that you, what you're saying that they possibly will be looking to bring on someone to, to to keep the business going or even expand their business to add more diversity. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Because uh, diversity, and not only in our industry, but if you look just, you know, here nationally, globally, diversity in all industries is just at the forefront. So. Um, women, women of color, um, they're looking for. So I think the opportunities are out there. It's just a matter of maximizing it and going after it. And it can be very lucrative. You know, um, when I first started, um, it was so interesting because uh, we talk about Trudy, Trudy, uh, who's the owner. And let me speak on her just a little, uh, just for a quick moment, because one of the things that attracted me to her was that she is female, She's married and she has four kids and she's a boss. <laughs> and for that reason alone, I was like, you know what? That is that's that's the blueprint right, right there. Right. And the other thing was is that Trudy was willing though. She was willing to have someone come in and she saw something in me just like I saw something in her and it's been a great partnership. And I met Trudy Osmond, by the way. Hey Trudy. <laughs> <laughs> and and so that's that's really important. But you know, having said that, you know, you you can. The again the opportunities are there. It's just finding the network. Go to the CFP's website. The CFP's website is not secure. Um you can go in and look for for opportunities. Um if there are local advisors in your area, in your region, reach out to them. Oftentimes they need help, you know, and again, even if you have to start out as an assistant, um, do that, work your way up, become a junior advisor. Um, and then again, with so many older practices, a lot of times family, they have no interest in the business. Right. So right. even even coming in or even presenting yourself or positioning yourself in such a fashion where you can even go in and maybe purchase that practice. So then that way you're going in, you already have a book of business under you, and then you just maintain and continue to grow in itself from there. So Ooh. there are opportunities that are available. It's just a matter of um, navigating your way well, through you it. Taking the yeah, absolutely. necessary steps yep. to get there. Man, that's amazing. That's amazing. You've given us a, um, a great wealth of knowledge. Um, I'm pretty sure anyone who sees this episode, you know, would say the, uh, say the same. I'm glad you was able to stop by. You know, I know, you know, your uh, you all's trip home is coming to an end. You know, we, <laughs> like I say, we, I'm glad you you was able to squeeze this time in for us, man. Absolutely. On this little segment of our um, focus on businesses in the CSRA and abroad. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, we're going to try to wrap this up, man. And um, we thank each and every one of you all for joining us again on the Melanated Perspective. We ask that you like, share, and subscribe to our podcast and keep supporting us. We want to give a big shout out to my sis, Dominica Henderson Reese, again for stopping by with us with her beautiful family (laughs) (laughs) who's behind the scenes. And um, we can't wait to see you all next week on our uh, next episode. Thanks for having me. All right.